Welcome, welcome once again to Rick Helps Real Estate Show. We have brought back Jason Maggart. Jason is a real estate agent, a lender, and bond mark ex bond market extraordinaire, right? <laughs> ex extraordinaire is a good, <laughs> a good name. An ex extraordinaire, yeah. So now. <laughs> Um, just in, in fairness, now you, you predicted that rates would be hovering around 9% now. And, and, uh, and then also Barry Habib said they'd be about 5.5. So we're just going to tee it up and say, well, nobody's ever right, but <laughs> Hey, it's fun to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought we would, we were at like seven and a half when you and I talked last time and you said, okay, are we going, are we going, are we going to see nine first or six first? And boy, we got close there. We came down into the low sixes. Um, I still would actually place my money on nine before six at this point. I know, you know, obviously they ran up to eight and then they pulled back to about six and a half. But I don't think there's any pressure whatsoever. The economy is not falling apart. It's not teetering with these interest rates, you know, whatsoever. Um, so there's in reality, there's probably slight pressure to have higher rates going forward, you know, not significantly, but to some degree. Yeah. I mean, all the people predicting uh, recessions for the past year um, are still waiting and uh, we're not seeing it, but the, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the debt too, because I put a section in uh, a poll in my uh, community section asking about the federal debt and our national debt is $34 trillion and it's growing at $1 trillion every 100 days. And I said, is this an issue? And, um, one of the choices was nothing to see here. Um, and I think the other one was, uh, um, it's going to raise interest rates. Uh, we're just going to continue to kick the can down the road or we'll inflate our way out of it. And uh, 34 to 37% of the people surveyed said nothing to see here. And I thought, that's interesting. Uh, what is your take on the amount of debt that we have now? And where do you think this is headed? And secondly, uh, will this have an impact on mortgage rates? So I was one of those that voted for nothing to see here. <laughs> and I was, I was pretty excited okay. to see that that was one of the options. Uh, mainly because in my studies, uh, financial studies in college and, and throughout uh, my, you know, working career, they've talked a lot about it where a tier one country, you know, which America obviously is, we're basically at the top of a tier one country. Once the debt gets to about 75% of GDP, and I just looked that up, uh, that occurred in about 2007, when the United States debt hit around 9 trillion and the GDP was around 12 trillion, you basically hit a tipping point where you're never going to pay the debt off. It's, it's a foregone conclusion at that point that it'll grow slowly and really good economic times. And it'll grow very quickly in bad economic times. And we haven't had a balanced budget, you know, since Clinton, which whenever that was, that was the late nineties or whatnot. So this has been something that's going on and on and on. And now we're up to 125%. We're going to go to 200%. We're probably going to go to 300%. You know, and people think, oh my gosh, well, how, how can that occur? You know, the interest rate debt on it's just going to be crushing. Something to think about. Part of the reason that the government is adding a, a trillion every 100 days, half of that is interest. So they're actually just paying themselves yeah. back on the, <laughs> so half of it is overspending. The other half is having to make the interest payment back to themselves by writing a new debt note says, well, we don't have the money to pay you, you know, but here's the payment. It's another payment. <laughs> and we're going to so, play that. We're going to play that game <laughs> to the end. So, so they don't have to finance it. Yeah. They just, they tack it on. It would be, you know, it'd be like me if I had a hundred thousand dollar loan with you, and I said, hey, Rick, I can't make the $1,000 payment this month, but here's, you know, another $1,000 note that says I will make, you know, the payment in the future. So you're just collecting more of these little paper notes going, okay, <laughs> I trust in Jason. <laughs> well, that sounds like the movie Dumb and Dumber, where they just, every time they spend something, they put it on a sticky note. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's they pretty much what the, the federal, 
Oh, yeah. That's pretty much what the federal government. I wouldn't be surprised if the federal government just had, doesn't have like a little notebook yeah, and a bunch of sticky notes. And they're like, who do we owe a trillion to now? Oh, okay, one trillion over there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, so, but at some point, I mean, does it not have any kind of impact? I mean, because you're, you're, you're squeezing a lot of liquidity out of the market, sort of, and making credit kind of harder to get possibly and that could have an impact on mortgage rates i mean at some point um and i and i mean between now and next year won't this play into mortgage rates well it plays into interest rates for sure and this is how so now that we are in a debt doom cycle is what i like to call it meaning we can't even generate enough income on the federal level to make the interest payments that means the debt will forever be growing. So what that means is, and the government's not gonna stop spending. And a lot of people don't think the very next step, what does that mean? Well, the government is about 30 to 40% of all tax receipts. And what I mean by that is, you know, think you got the bus drivers, you have the road people, you know, you have federal government, state government, they actually are a huge chunk of the economy. So if they keep printing money to keep themselves in business, you have a built-in inflation base. So we have built-in inflation. It's no longer going to go away. It's no longer going to be zero. You know, we might have a year with a really bad recession where it dips down to zero or negative 2%, but this trend of 2% inflation is a joke. It's it's going to have a hard time ever being under four or five. I know they're reporting it as a three, but raise everybody raise your hand if you feel you're experiencing 3% inflation right now. <laughs> I'd be like celebrating. Oh, yeah. 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 I just got off the phone with my insurance company. I'm like, what's this new $127 charge? And they're like, oh, we looked at your policy and we forgot to update you into the new, you know, pricing, you know, paradigm. I'm like, well, that's not my problem. That's your, you know, for my car. Yeah, like, yeah. So it's like an 8% increase in my car insurance, just like that, you know? So the well, money I looked up chases inflation. And so inflation does impact then what mortgage rates can be you know what they truly can be well i i looked up when does the federal debt reach unsustainable levels and came across an article of october last year from the wharton school of business and basically they said i'm not going to put this up front i'll just read you a couple of key points the u.s public debt outstanding 33.2 trillion often cited by media is largely misleading as it includes 6.8 trillion that the federal government owes itself the little post-it note you just talked about right mm -hmm. due to trust fund and other accounting the economics profession has long focused on debt held by the public currently equal to about 98 percent of gdp 26.3 trillion for assessing its effects on the economy so they said we estimate the u.s debt will be held by public cannot exceed about 200 percent of gdp even under today's generally favorable market conditions so they're starting from a base of 98 percent and saying when it gets to 200 percent, we're in trouble now we're at 124 percent now that's total debt not public debt under current fiscal policy united states has about 20 years of corrective action so we got 20 years to try and do something about this and after which no amount of future tax increases or spending cuts could avoid the government defaulting. Time frame is the best case scenario for the United States. So it could be said that, well, in 20 years, you know, a lot of the baby boomers that are collecting uh, Medicare and Social Security are going to be gone. So That's you've cool. really relieved a lot of expenditure then. Um, nothing like us dying to help fiscal policy. Uh, <laughs> But, but that's that's out there you know can you, hey, can you imagine that chart we have a plan we realize there's about 60 million people that are going to die off the social security and medicare rules our budget's going to be fine everyone yeah i imagine a president standing up and saying that you know you know his campaign promise don't worry a lot of you are going to be dead <laughs> we've got time <laughs> that took an ugly turn yeah but, so now why haven't with interest rates going up um why haven't house prices had the same percentage of decline that they had last year when 
interest rates first went up. I mean, because I think you and I are both surprised at the, you know, I saw asking prices coming out there and they go, oh, they'll never get that. And they did, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the huge, yeah, one of the things that you and I called back in the spring, summer of 2022, as soon as rates started going up, we're like, well, something's going to break and it's most li likely going to be prices. And, you know, the whole country, it's different everywhere, right? But we're fairly similar. We're out here on the West Coast. A lot of Seattle people go, you know, to the Phoenix and, and that. So they're, although climate's completely different, the socioeconomic level is, is pretty similar. And we noticed a 10 to 12% decline, which I think you guys did too, into that fall of 2022. You know, it was as, as the inventory creeped up and rates went from three to seven, uh, you know, prices went down. So I think that was like an initial shock. We're now 15 months away from that. So it kind of has time to settle in where, you know, how long do you sit on the sidelines? I was thinking about, you know, not to bring up these guys, I hate giving time to these crash bros, but <laughs> think about someone who bought a house in 2021, got in a bidding war, overpaid by 20,000, 50,000, whatever, but they got a 3% interest rate. I was just thinking about that before we came on here. They've actually paid their loan down. You ready for this? On average, around seven to eight percent in the last three years, because they have such a low interest rate. So a huge amount goes towards principal. So even though they overpaid, let's say they got a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage, it's already down to four hundred sixty five thousand. The crash, there has been no crash. The crash really won't affect them. They have a very livable payment, and they've already built up equity by paying down their house. So. I think it's just that it's fine. It, it's sitting on people's mind, the prices and the payments, just like they did in the 80s, right? If you if you study really deep the housing in the late 70s and the 80s, it was a whole bunch of spurts of interest rates up, prices flattened and went down a little bit. But within six to 12 months, house prices went right back up. And it's just because people have to move. People need to sign new leases. People need to buy a house. You know, they have a kid or two kids. And they're like, we can't stay in the apartment forever. We have to bite the bullet. We have to eat the $500 more a month, the $1,000 more a month. And so it's it's just, it's just here and people are accepting it to a higher degree. Well, so what do you think about, because um, I can't stand this phrase and I don't like it because it just came out. Somebody married the house date to rate, came out, stuck with it and people are cheerleading it. And like, you know, a real estate agents, you're not economists. And so- Stop telling people that, you know, rates are going to come down in the future because we really don't know, do we? Boy, there was I mean, I would say more than 50 percent of all realtors and even lenders were promoting, hey, let's do something, you know, funky with your rate. We can do a two one buy down. We can do whatever. We can do a dance, a rain dance. And, you know, in a year or two, we'll get your payment down five hundred thousand dollars. Don't panic about your payment today. And that, that didn't play out, did it? You know, that, that was when rates were at five and six, remember? <laughs> now yeah, here we are yeah. at seven. And those people, those people are coming to the end of their two one buy down. And they're like, wait a second, rates are higher than even our, our two one buy down rate. We're, you know. So that that was not good advice. And I agree with you. You you were pounding the pavement back then, like, hey, that you know, you're marrying the house and you're marrying the rate too. <laughs> you know. There's yeah, no, I, you no, know, there's it no could, guarantee. It, you know, with rates where they are today, it, that could work. Okay. Yeah. I mean, a two one buy down could work if the seller is is making the buy down for you. Um, if if you can get a seller to buy down your rate over the 30 year term, much, much better. Mm -hmm. But the two one uh buy down could work if all if everything lines up correctly. I'm just not comfortable saying that everything's going to line up correctly because I, I always want, I want certainty. I, I want to know in two years. Now the two, one buy down, a lot of them that I've seen, you do have certainty that you know that at the end of it, you know what your payment's going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so you have that, but, but you're going to have to have the fiscal discipline to know that that higher payment's coming and be prepared for it. And so I think, um, saying pairing the two one buy down with the statement that you can marry the house and date the rate gives people this false hope. Mm -hmm. And I say false hope because it may or may not happen that down the road, indeed rates will be lower. Well, if they're not, you're sitting back there pretending that you can handle the new payment that's going to come along and you 
probably won't be able to unless there's huge wage inflation in your current job. Exactly. So and I, I think, you know, don't don't preach that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wish that phrase would completely go away because oh. yeah, nobody's had the time to refi. The rates haven't come back down to five. I, I know that, you know, it, it was hard for people to get their mind around what we'd been in the we'd been in the four percent range for what four or five years before look before we did that dip into below three, right? So four just seemed like the norm. But if if you go back any time before that, you know, take decades, it's been in the sixes, sevens, and eights. And so, you know, all of us old timers, <laughs> we were like, this is the golden age here, guys. Four percent's golden, you know, three's the golden goose and two point something. I don't know. Someone just handed you, you know, a gift with the biggest bow on it ever. Um, oh, know, I'll never forget. Somebody made a comment and said, I've got a 2.75 rate. When do you think I can refinance? And I said, never. Yeah. It, in You'll our never life, see that again, ever. Yeah. In our lifetime, I don't think it will. I don't, I, I would, I would almost bet many, we won't see under four again, like in our lifetime, it would take, it would take, it can't happen now with the national debt, just like you said. So if you only go back four or five years, the national debt was only growing by maybe a trillion every 365 days. We're now at a trillion every hundred days. As soon as there's a hiccup in the economy, the national debt's going to go up a trillion every 30 days. We're going to start adding almost a trillion a month on the next hiccup where they have to print money. They have to do something, you know, and I mean, it's the, that number is just going to grow exponentially and just be a crazy shocking number. And, and 200% might be right. We, you know, so we get to 60 trillion or whatever, 70 trillion. And now it is a problem, you know? Like, well, do you know how old you would be if you were a trillion minutes old? I heard you ask that question months. once before. Probably a few hundred years. You would be 62,000 years. Oh, 62,000. <laughs> I don't get a trillion minutes. <laughs> yeah. Now, if we live to 62,000, um, again, there's going to be more pressure on Medicare and Social Security. So, so you know, you don't, you don't want that to happen. But uh, I think so. Um, I don't like to stick my neck out and say where I think real estate is going to be a year from now. Cause I, again, I'm preaching from a soapbox here. I don't know, but from what I'm seeing today and, and we're, we're just, we're stuck. Um, new construction is coming on. It's the, the new permits are starting to come down a little bit, which to me means they're managing the inventory better. They are, they are selling. They're up 14% versus last year. Uh, there's definitely people stand put in their resale homes. They're not putting them on the market and it's, it's because of rate lock. Um, there's a huge amount of people that, uh, um, if you look at sun city and sun lakes, the retirement communities, they're almost all cash purchases. Uh, so nobody's moving. And so I don't see anything changing. Uh, you know, like I have Pat on the show and we're saying, we're probably going to be looking at this in the next two years, just like right where we are right now. Yeah, I would agree with you this time around. The builders definitely learned their lesson from that last crash, right? It was, you know, it was build with abandon last time. Um, I mean, I, I saw it everywhere out here where, you know, they, they'd clear it out and they'd pour a hundred foundations and be framing them up. And now I have, I can probably drive to 20 developments within 10 miles of me, maybe five miles. And they are all just building five at a time or seven at a time, you know, and then they're selling them when they're 80, 90 percent done. So the builders definitely learned their lesson. You know, don't get out in front with hundreds and hundreds of thousands or an extra million of inventory because we're just shooting ourselves in our own foot. They they definitely have to be talking all those big ones, you know, Lennar and uh, Dr. Horton. I'm, I mean, they, they, they work together because it doesn't make sense to go, hey, we're going to build tens of thousands, you guys only build a few. So I, I agree, inventory is gonna be a limited thing for a long time. Like there's there's no ticking time bomb for inventory coming online, you know, that they, they, that other people keep predicting. Oh, the inventory is gonna come and then and then you'll see it get smashed. Where's oh, the yeah. where's the inventory gonna come from? Where? 
Well, I, I, I think they ran out of designs for how to say that there's going to be another 30% to 50% drop in their thumbnails. I, yeah. I just think, <laughs> you know, that yellow 30% is like, oh, I must, I think I've already seen this video. So the people are moving yeah. on. Um, I, you know, I, when you see the number of permits that housing, the new, new construction companies are, are getting, that doesn't mean they're building them. Mm -hmm. It means they got them penciled in. They're getting the permits. Then once you got the permit, you know, they may hold on to them for a while. Like a build this and I, I've got permission to build, you know, 4,000 homes here. So I'll do 200 this month <laughs> and then yeah. let's wait and see how things are going. Cause they're locking up the land and they're building. I went to an agriculture summit on Friday and uh, um, it was agriculture and agriculture appraisers. They were talking about how they appraise land and saw a lot of economic data out there. And it was, it was very interesting about how many farms are being purchased for so solar panel fields. Hmm. And that this is going to be the future um, is what people think, but they were pointing out solar only produces power for eight hours, but then you have to have a huge bank of batteries to hang on to it so you can have power all night. They said, so it's really expensive. You know, solar's not as cheap as everybody thinks it is. So farmers are where they're making out like bandits is they're just kind of maintaining their farms, waiting for one of these solar farms to come in and say, hey, I'm going to give you, you know, $100,000 an acre. All right, I'll take it. So, so the farming is shrinking and we're getting solar panels. Um, learned a lot about growing pistachios. Anyway, going off on a tangent here, but it, it, <laughs> it's there's, good. there's, there's a lot of people still moving to Arizona and I'm going to be interviewing. Her name is, um, Joanna all hands and she's with the uh, 12 news, um, in the, the Arizona Republic. And she, she's considered a, uh, expert on water usage in Arizona. I'm going to be bringing her on the show, but the bottom line is that Farmers aren't worried about not having water. They're worried about government overreach on when they can have water. Uh, they've got their own water districts where they manage it. So they don't want the state coming in and taking over what they're already managing. Mm -hmm. And so that was the biggest concern that, that I saw. Residential doesn't look like there's a problem, but, but nobody wants to believe that. You know, it's Arizona. We're running out of water. I'm not moving here. Okay, fine. Well, Lots of people are, <laughs> but oh, yeah. I want to, I don't want to hear from her. Nice. Yeah. I, I agree with you on the water thing. There's so many ways you can reduce home water usage and I'm not being a proponent of that. Just there's, I mean, think about it, you know, back, back when I was younger, I remember the shower heads used to pump out like five gallons a minute. So you took a 10 minute shower that was 50 gallons of water. <laughs> I think most of them now are like a gallon a minute or something. So with all of those, those things, like um, the, the amount of water usage that you can really restrict a home down to, especially if they, you know, limit yards and stuff. I mean, truly what, what you're using on your, in your own basis and, you know, toilet flushing and showers that drops down. So, so little that I, I just, I just don't foresee a water shortage I mean, we got gigantic rivers and, and they'll always, you know, where they'll go to, if it gets really bad, they, they can des desalinate the ocean water. Like that's totally doable. Well, so. that's for, yeah, but you're, I mean, that's you do that. Now your mortgage, your water bill is going to be about the size of your mortgage payment. If you try to pay for a desalinization yeah. plant and there's a lot of environmental <laughs> concerns. Oh, um, so that's, a, that's a whole nother show. Let me talk about inflation for a minute. <laughs> um, you know, cause it was easy for them to get the 9% down to what they call 3% right now, but that 3% to 2%, that, that that's still a pretty heavy hit. And you're only going to get there if they really squeeze things further. And if they squeeze things even further, you're going to lose tax revenue and income. You're just going to drive up the debt. It's a vicious circle right now. And, and you know, 3 and 4% shouldn't be an alarm bell on inflation. It's just that it's on top of, 9%. It's sticky. So that box of cereal that you're buying went up last year. It's not coming down. Um, so I, how long do you think they're going to hang in there trying to push inflation down to 2%? Because 
the central bank's trying to clamp down, but the federal government, you know, I look at third quarter spending last year was like 10 trillion. And so that's, what's affecting us now. So do you think they're just going to go Ah, three is good? They, yeah, they might talk that they're going to try to get it down to two. They're not. <laughs> they're not really going to try. Yeah. If if they wanted to try, they'd take the Fed funds rate to seven or eight percent, and then they'd get us down to two percent inflation, maybe one or zero. But then you've got a complete, you know, crushing of the economy, like you said. The people wouldn't even want that either, right? You, you want you want ten percent unemployment, but two percent inflation, or are you okay with four percent unemployment? and three to 4% inflation. I mean, basically everyone's gonna choose, all right, I have to pay an extra 1% a year, but nobody gets laid off. There's no big you know, catastrophe. There's not 10% mortgages. So I, I, I think they're just riding steady and wherever the, wherever the inflation lands, holding this whole, you know, holding this plane in a holding pattern, basically, they're, they, they might talk out outside of their mouth, you know, one side of their mouth saying they're trying to get down to two, but they're not. They would have kept upping the they would have kept upping the Fed funds rate. Well, if we see interest rates at four percent, we've got bigger fish to fry at that point. We have other problems. Yeah, if, yeah. If they, for yeah, them, if they drop. open up the floodgates of money again, they had to do it for a reason. There, mm -hmm. the central bank is not moving rates to satisfy housing. They're moving rates to, you know, to keep. Inflation in check and to keep employment sound. So it, we could have houses could go up another ten percent next year. They're not going to care. Exactly that. That no, they're they're about big business and employment. The government brings in money off of payroll taxes and likes to see big business do well. So that's if you really want to know what they're watching and looking at, that's what they're looking at. <laughs> and and whatever. The well, it's going to be interesting to see the rest of the year. So now when they when they came out and you know. When, when the chairman said, you know, we're looking at some of the numbers and it looks like maybe beginning in March that we may start to be easing on rates and other people in the dot plot kind of put their guesses in. And immediately people were saying, we're going to get four to six rate cuts this year. And I'm standing back going, he didn't say that. So how many rate cuts do you think we're going to get this year? And are we even going to get any rate cuts this year? Yeah, that was crazy how last winter and fall, even realtors and mortgage people, they were all they were posting all kinds of memes about six rates cuts coming next year. You know, five five percent mortgages will be here by spring. You know, here we are in March. <laughs> we're at seven. I yeah, yeah. It, it's nobody's guess. If the economy doesn't go off the rails, I think we see none. There's yeah. no reason. There's no reason to have any cuts. This, this is. Houses are selling, right? Prices are going up. Everybody's still, there's, you know, there's the big, big headline layoffs, but on a percentage basis, the layoffs are, they're over here. And then other people are hiring over here. Like we're on one of the easiest flowing economies, honestly, for the last two, three years, just the house prices and, and mortgage payments suck. <laughs> As do truck well, payments. Well, let's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, let's check back again and let's see in June if if anything moves. That so you got March and then you have May, right? Um, so for Fed actions, um, I don't. I think even the bond market surveyors have only got a a rate cut at a thirty four percent probability in May. Just why so they're they're kind of yeah they're starting to back off a little bit but we'll check back and we'll see how things are going and see how wrong we are yet again <laughs> that's what predicting is all about see how far off you're that's from the right. target that's right hey look videos can be deleted and i've seen people do it so <laughs> <laughs> but jason I, I thank you for joining me and i hope to have you on as a future guest again all right thanks so much rick i enjoyed it take care all right bye-bye